winter. If you are poor, you cannot afford to have an air conditioner on summer. If you are poor, you cannot afford to buy clothes. And if you are poor, you can go hungry and naked or homeless. So you probably could add more to this list. The point is, if you, can, if you are poor, you can have anything that your heart desires. Now conversely, to those of us who experience being rich, and I'm sure some of us have experienced it one way or the other, and in fact, we who are here today are so much richer than about 70% of the people in the world. But there is nothing woeful about being rich. We can list down a lot of advantages if you are rich. If you are rich, you can eat delicious food as much as you like. If you are rich, you can buy the most you can go to the most expensive Ivy League university. If you are rich, you can throw a lavish party. If you are rich, you can pay all your tinted bills and even more. If you are rich, you can afford the best doctors in the world. If you are rich, you can live in a mansion or in a castle. If you are rich, you can afford to heat your home on winter or go to Hawaii. If you are rich, you can afford to have an air conditioner on summer or go to Iceland. If you are rich, you can afford to have a huge closet and fill it with expensive clothes and shoes like Imelda. If you are rich, you can never go hungry or go naked or homeless. You could probably add more to this list, but the point is, if you are rich, you can have all your heart desires. So the Gospel this morning, called the Beatitudes of Jesus, seem to be out of the ordinary, out of this world. Jesus lifted up his eyes and to the poor disciples and announced, Blessed are you poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who hunger now, for you shall be filled. Blessed are you who weep now, for you shall laugh. Then he looked to the aristocrats of the Jewish society and denounced, But woe unto you who are rich, for you have received your consolation. Woe to you who are full, for you shall hunger. Woe to you who laugh now, for you shall mourn and weep. Now, what does Jesus up to? Does he mean it is right to be poor and wrong to be rich? Prophets in the Old Testament do three things. They denounce sin, they pronounce judgment, and they announce hope. In this gospel, Jesus announced hope to the poor and pronounced judgment to the rich. But he did not denounce any sin. He did not mention sin. What is the sin of the rich? What is the righteousness of the poor? Now he did not mention sin because sin in all its protean forms are clearly written in the structure of the unjust Jewish society. It is written in the social, political, and economic system that prevailed at the time of Jesus and continues to prevail even today. The root cause of this sin from the time when the chosen people of God when they wanted to become like any other nation. They were tired of being a primitive communal society, a participatory, participatory democracy which Moses instituted <coughs> while they were in the wilderness of Sinai. When they were truly a community sharing with one another, 
from the provision that God has given them. But they were tired of waiting for the Lord, waiting for the manna to come in the daytime and perishes at the night. They were tired of waiting for the bread that comes down and disappears at night. In other words, they were tired of living by faith. They wanted to live by sight. And having conquered the promised land of Canaan, they abandoned their designation as a special people. They wanted to become like any other nations. And so the kingdom of Israel was born. First one to be king was Saul. He did not measure to the standard of God. And so the man after his own heart, David, was anointed. David was a miracle. The shepherd boy who defeated Goliath. Turning from rags to riches, he came, he saw, he conquered. And the kingdom of Israel rose up. After David came Solomon, who despite his God-given talent and wisdom and inherited riches, he squandered the legacy of his father David by living a life of excess. From his own testimony, Solomon said in Ecclesiastes, I surpassed everyone before me in Jerusalem. Whatever my heart desires, I get it. Now that image in Solomon continues to be the paragon, the ideal of almost everyone, to be rich, to be super rich, to be super powerful, that is the banner that is lifted out in the world. Solomon's kingdom spread from east to west, from north to south. His closet was a huge array of precious self. Solomon's treasure one cannot fathom. Gold and silver and diamonds, spoils of war and feudal aggrandizements. Then Solomon built a harem, 700 wives and 300 porcupines. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Concubines. I always get a mistake. They worshipped the entire Solomon towards idolatry and polytheism and syncretism, which were abominations to the God of Abraham. Isaac and Jacob. This kingdom of excess perpetuated the value of materialism. This kingdom has perpetuated the division of people between the rule, the ruler and the rule, the rich and the poor, the oppressor and the oppressed. And so when Solomon died, his children and grandchildren fought with one another, divided the kingdom and heightened the unjust structure of this society. Prophets rose up to remind Israel and Judah of their apostasy. But as leaders, instead of listening to the prophets, stoned them to death. As a result, they were invaded by Syria, Assyria, and Babylon, and the leaders were exiled. Yet the sins of the fathers continued to the third and fourth generations. And when they finally returned to Israel, the vestiges of this unjust society remained unchecked. So this is the sin. This is the theology of excess that Jesus was trying to denounce. His gospel was not about a reversal of fortune between the rich and the poor. His gospel is the reversal of the values that make up an unjust society. And for this to happen, there has to be three things to change. First, there must be a revolution of values. Jesus announced that the values of the kingdom will transform society. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Jesus is bringing up, bringing up, bringing down the values of heaven to come down on earth. For the values of earth is materialism. Wealth is the be-all and end-all of human existence. Love is not. Abraham Maslow, as a sociologist, popularized the theory of hierarchy of needs. It says, first, you must be fully satisfied with, 
with material things. Second, you have to fill all your social needs. After that, your political needs. And only then will you seek your spiritual need. But Jesus reversed the process when he said in Matthew 6, 33, Seek ye first the kingdom of God, and all these things shall be added unto you. Spirit before matter. The kingdom of God is a kingdom where the spirit predominates over matter. And it is because when spirit, when materialism predominates you, you will become insatiable in your greed. The second thing that must change is the meaning of success. Just where the successor to Moses said to God's people, This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth. You shall meditate on it day and night. Then you will be prosperous and have good success. It started as an adherence to the law of God. But it ended up as a corruption of the meaning of success. Success has become the survival of the fittest. Each to his own. The end justifies the mean. Though adorned with sophistication, it was actually the law of the jungle, devoid of love and compassion. Have no compassion for the poor and the needy. Your task to be successful is to step on everyone's toe to get ahead. The prophet Amos denounced that injustice. Love and goodness reject not the needy. The poor and the oppressed are not the Lord's dream. But you have turned justice to poison and given the fruit to the world. And so I want justice like free flowing waters, righteousness like God given stream, like cascading stream.